<laughs> this is Up Close. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. What should we think about people who seem to have almost an obsession with helping others? The story of pathologist Bennett Omalu is now a major motion picture starring Will Smith. But if the National Football League had had its way, Omalu's findings would never have seen the light of day. His devotion to telling the truth about head injuries in football and how he developed that devotion is told by Jean Marie Laskus, author of Concussion. And then, so-called do-gooders sometimes place the lives of complete strangers ahead of those of members of their families and communities, and even their own. Is there something wrong with them, or are they on the right track? New Yorker staff writer Larissa McFarker talks about her book, Strangers Drowning, grappling with impossible idealism, drastic choices, and the overpowering urge to help. But first, here's my interview with Jean Marie Laskus. Now, there are a lot of ways in which we find there's information that is hidden from us that's very important, mm. that we should have known about. Mm. One of the really scary things about this whole thing with head trauma in football and in other contact sports is that not only is it information that's that's been hard to find for decades, but it's literally hidden even while p people are alive. It cannot be diagnosed while people are, people are alive. It, how has it been to, to kind of to peel back the layers of that story and to show how this really hidden information is is impacting so many lives? It's hidden in so many ways. Not only is it a hidden disease inside the brain that you can only diagnose in autopsy, CTE is a, you know, the diagnosis, it's only when you're dead do you get to know if you have this thing. Similar to Alzheimer's in that way. But more insidious, I think, is that the disease as it was discovered back in 2005 um, has been, you know, the, the National Football League has systematically tried to hide it. So it's like hidden on top of hidden. We as the public and as the fans of football and as the players and their families haven't really been given this information. That's really the part that ignited me to write the book. There are people out there who are talking about well, balancing the risks and benefits and if you have a series of risks, there's some increased likelihood of, of brain trauma, of depression, and so on and so forth resulting from brain trauma. Well, but look at the great benefits of being a professional athlete in various ways. But the thing is, you need to have at least informed consent in order to weigh those risks and benefits. And that really is the argument of Bennett Omalu, who, who figured this thing out. Um, that's all he was trying to do. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't against football. He was an, an immigrant from Nigeria who came to this country, a brilliant scientist who didn't know American football, had no agenda. He found this in a brain and wanted to tell people about it, wanted to tell the NFL about it. That's all. You know, they should know. They should know that the players should know that they're at risk. Um, and, you know, they didn't. They didn't know. And many of them still are just learning that that's the risk, to say nothing of the parents of kids who are playing. So that's where the awareness really all needs to happen now. Right, and before we dig into the details of the story, as you see the risks, and you've been now been reporting on this for six years, I think? Since 2009. As you see the risks, what do you tell parents, what do you tell, uh, tell people who are, in fact, adults in college and what have you about the risks of contact sports? Well, it's, it's particularly in football. Because it's, you know, it's not just concussion. Everyone knows, logic will tell you, a big hit in the head is bad for you. The big, giant, dramatic hit you see a football player take, you know, or anybody get, that's bad for you. That, that is not news. What is the news of this disease is that it's not that. It's the subconcussive hits that you don't notice that the linemen on, on a football field take play after play after play, every practice, every play. It's that accumulation of those subconcussive sub hits that are that are causing this. And so, what can you do about that? Nothing. You can't. You have to. You have to not play football. You have to take the helmet off. You have to take the head out of the game. You just. That's that's it. Until we know more. Until we know how to cure it, diagnose it in a living person. But right now, I mean, for football, I would say, I would have to say, if I had to give a recommendation, my opinion, I would certainly not let, let my kids play. To get to that knowledge required a very circuitous route mm -hmm. um, in, in one sense because there were people actively campaigning to keep this kind of information from ever seeing the light of day, but also because it took a special kind of curiosity and a special yeah. kind of, 
of insight and a special kind of dedication to, mm -hmm. to even begin to find the sources of information that, that would lead to this. It took someone, as I said, with no agenda, um, who, you know, the story really is that, that, that you know, Bennett O'Malo, he comes to this country, he's working as a neuropathologist in Pittsburgh, just doing his day job, you know, doing autopsies. And he gets the body of Mike Webster, former Pittsburgh Steeler, famous Steeler, to, to do an autopsy on. He doesn't know who he is. Everyone's saying, what's oh, Mike Webster? Mike Webster, he's like, who is this? Um, and Mike Webster had gone crazy. Mike Webster had been tasering himself, super gluing his teeth in, demented, living out of his car died of a heart attack at 50. Um, the, the, the cause of death was heart attack. There was no reason to look any further, except for Ben had said, well, wait a minute, why did he go crazy? How does a 50-year-old guy go crazy? And no one is asking why. And that's what he asked. And that's when he started digging and looking and took the brain home, paying his own, out of his own money, just a curious scientist trying to figure out what happened to this guy. He figures it out. He publishes it in the scientific journals and the league comes back and says, retract it. You're lying, you're a fraud. And that began his journey. Right, and what made him the kind of person who would do these things? He is a, an academic, a scientist, a focused, um, needs to solve problems, kind of genuine, pure scientist. Um, and also he's a like, really strong faith. His sense of himself, in that autopsy room is that he's talking to this dead person and translating. He says to Mike Webster, Mike, I'm here to help you. Mike Webster's dead. I'm here to help you, Mike. I'm gonna figure out, I'm gonna, we're gonna figure out what happened to you. We have to do this together. Right, he's That's like a TV guy. character, right? Yeah. That, he, that, he would, that he was the kind of guy, he, he talked to the bodies yeah. before he would, would autopsy. And he them. did that with everyone. You know, it was like, let's do this together. Let's figure this out. That's the kind of guy, that's, that's unusual. I mean, he's, he's an unusual, quirky guy, um, but it was just, the sort of right combination to be the guy to just keep going and going and going to figure this out. There was a lot of pressure on him growing up to be something special. Mm -hmm. Why was that? So, you know, he's born in the Nigerian Civil War, in the war. His, parents, his dad was bombed with shrapnel in the bed next to him when he was born. That's his family's background. Literally, that in the, his, his mother is delivering him in the hospital. Yes. And in comes his father right. with injuries from from, from the, a bomb. Right, from a bomb. So he's nearly dead. Ben is just born. So Bennett becomes, you know, in the family lore, the angel that brought his father back to life. That's sort of just like what was bestowed upon him, his identity. So that was a lot of pressure growing up. You know, you are now, Bennett, you're the angel. You're going to, you can only do wonderful things. Well, you know, <laughs> he's a kid. He doesn't want to do wonderful things. He just wants to be a kid. Um, he was really protected by his family, a large family many siblings, very protected, never let, let out of the compound walls in Nigeria where they, they thought it was just too dangerous for him. Pushed to go to medical school because he's brilliant at 16, didn't want to go to medical school, didn't want to be a doctor. He was just doing what was required of him by the family. Um, and then he really wanted to come to America. Like that was his dream. To be the best version of himself, he had to be in America. And he came here. Right, though I thought it was interesting at one point he says, if I'd known about this whole racial history of the United States, oh. I wouldn't have come. He, this is how protected this guy was. He did not understand racism. He did not. He, he lands in Seattle, <laughs> and people are treating him differently than they treated him back home. He didn't literally understand it. He had to ask his newly made friends who were from Nigeria and other countries in Africa, what is going on? Why are, why are people looking at me like this? This is how naive he was. Um, and the more he learned about kind of like this, this piece of America, it was, so, it was so disillusioned. It was so disheartening to him. How can this be true in this country that I thought was God's country? In a sense though, it's his naivete that would allow him to be the kind of scientist he became because he was particularly, you talk about how you know, he, he, ch d he chose specifically not to do academic appointments and not to do the traditional career path that many scientists take where he, he instead said, wait a second, I could work as, uh, as a pathologist uh, and I, I can work uh, you know, doing auto autopsies and kind of do whatever research seems to present itself. Yeah. And, and 
nobody, and because nobody knew to go looking inside brains for these kinds of diseases, nobody did. And then he, it's simply him saying, this is something I'm gonna do. I'm gonna look in brains for diseases. And, and, he, f and he found, he is now named a disease that now right. exists, right? right? He's got no academic backing for this research, no government funding. He funds it all himself, he, just because he wants to do it. You're right, it's like, he picked, a, he picked an area and he had a boss, Cyril Wecht at Pittsburgh, who would allow him to take this brain home. And um, yeah, he, he, he went looking. How did things go upon immediately making the discovery that there was something wrong here in Mike Webster's brain? He finds, you know, he slices the brain up and does these special staining that was unusual staining you wouldn't typically do. You wouldn't typically look at a brain anyway. He was the first person who would ever autopsied an NFL player brain at all. So it's unusual that he would even do that. But then he did all the special staining and he finds these, these what they're called tau protein clusters inside the brain, reminiscent of a, of a disease called dementia pugilistica in boxers that hadn't really been talked about since the 1970s maybe. And so he starts researching, researching, reading about that disease and sees the similarity. And if you follow the history of what happened with boxing in the US and England where it was the most popular sport, until that diagnosis, it's so similar to this same trajectory of what's happening with American football. How is it similar? Because the world, the, the country, did not want to know about it. They did not want to believe these guys. Similar, it was an autopsy. Similar, back in, back in the, um, the 20s, an autopsy that said, I, 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 I'm finding something in here. But nobody, everybody loved boxing. Nobody wanted to see it. No one wanted to believe it. There were boxers who regularly end up in asylums, regularly. And so people started saying, what's going on? But the public wanted boxing. It's really, I see it now. We now know, we've known since 2005, since Bennett published in the scientific literature, the NFL's known, we've known. And, but we don't know. We don't. Right. And so what happens when he decides he's publishing this information that many billions of dollars uh, would like to see go away in the form of the NFL and its teams, uh, which is probably in the neighborhood of a hundred billion dollar institution all told, mm -hmm. uh, and, um, and, and countless sports teams in, in, in college and high school, none of them really want to see this information come to light. So what do they do? The NFL was certainly the leader in, in doing. Um, they, Bennett's paper comes out in 2005. They demand a retraction. And they say, you know, they, they call him every name in the book and say it's not true. Um, but then, in the meantime, they had their own paid scientists. They had a committee of, of, of league, on the, on the payroll, league scientists who were putting out science in the same journal he published in, saying basically proving in their words, that there was no problem with concussions, that really, it, it's, we got it under control. And we're making better helmets, and we're doing all these things, and we're making it safer. So they, there, was a, there was an offensive that went in the, in the scientific literature that's played out. So they had this, what they called their Mild Traumatic Brain Injury Committee, committee. I think it was the MTBI mm -hmm. committee. Mm -hmm. um, and, it's, and it's just fascinating. The second that they come against, nobody questioned this committee for years, <laughs> right. right? And the second they come after uh, Bennett Omalu, he looks into them and he says, and he says, wait a second, your head is a rheumatologist. Right, right. Wait, who are these people criticizing me? Like, he starts looking into it. Yeah, the head of it is a rheumatologist. They're, they're paid by the NFL. He's like, how are these people refuting my science? science? Uh, you know, what do they know about brains? Oh, yeah, that's a pretty good question. And, and then how did that play out in the years to come? In 2009, after this first, um, the GQ article I wrote about Bennett, that's the first time any, he was written about, really, where we kind of recreated kind of what he did. Um, shortly after that, there were congressional hearings. They called Goodell and his committee down. The NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell. Roger right. Goodell, sorry. To come down to, to say, you know, to answer these, well, what's going on? And those were pretty tough hearings. Um, and not much came out of it. I mean, really, it was it was it made it made some some headlines, but you know what? Everybody loves football. We don't want this to be true. I don't want it to be true. I don't want to see football go away. I love football, but it's like we so easily 
want to believe that the league is taking a leadership role. And I don't know why we believe that. It's like believing the tobacco industry could take a leadership low role in cigarettes. It really is very similar. And what we're kind of saying, thank you, NFL. Yeah, you got this concussion under control. We have to stop believing them. I mean, one of the things that, that's going on is not, it's not just that the NFL has a responsibility theoretically to protect its players and to protect its employees, but, um, and the employees of its various teams and its, and its pensioners and what have you. But, but there's a role there that they play where if they say it's not true, there's not going to be a lot of high school coaches who, who, get to, who get to go around saying, no, believe me, I, I know what you saw on, on, on that big broadcast, but it, the, the, actually there really is this disease and here's how we have to deal with it and so on and so forth. Listen, it's going to be very hard. What the NFL says is true to the, to the football universe, you know, and that's the colleges. What, what college is going to stand up and say, actually, our program might be really dangerous? I mean, if the NFL says it's okay, we say it is too, all the way down to the peewee football le level. But it's also, we as the fans of football, we also, we also believe it's true. If they're gonna say it's true, we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna continue to applaud and cheer. And we've been duped. I, I mean, we've been duped. And as a fan, it's like, now I know this. It's like, now we have to have this conversation in this country. Like what, we know now, are we okay with this? I mean, how many suicides since Bennett's research? High profile. Dave Dorison, Junior Seau, beloved NFL players, killing themselves, donating, and leaving a note, Dorison did, saying, please look at my brain, something's wrong with me. How much does this have to happen before we say, yeah, maybe there's something going on here. Do we want to be watching this? Do we want to be paying for this? Do we want to be like eating our chicken wings, cheering on, as guys are like potentially causing their own dementia, if not sudden certain death. I was a big fan of Junior Seau's growing up oh, yeah. and uh, I always thought it was amazing that he was a middle linebacker whose last name was Say Al. <laughs> but but and and he <laughs> and and he you know and he did kill himself a few years ago and he shot himself in the chest so that uh, his brain would be preserved and sure enough there was CTE in his brain. And when you think about that and you think about all of this, does it make you can can you watch an NFL game anymore? I have a hard time personally. Now, especially now all I know, I can't watch it through the lens of what I used to see it through. You know, it's the same way, this is a, gr a sort of a gross metaphor, but I can't watch cockfighting. I feel sorry for the chicken, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a point where you go, oh, it, it, it sort of has that effect now, like, I, I can see what's happening, I mean, I can see what the potential is happening. Plus I've met so many of these players and so many of their families and seen the devastation in these families where they're just, there's just ruination. And they say, the families say, if we had known this, we would have never, ever, he would have never played. So, you know, you see, you hear enough of these stories. A lot of these stories aren't really being told. They're sad. You don't want to hear them. But you sit with them long enough, you go, you know what? This isn't, this is not okay. So we had to do something, really. And I, I don't think it's the, I don't think the answer is stop football. I mean, it's embedded in our culture, we love it, but the science has to continue by unpaid, by the scientists that are not funded by the NFL to figure it out. There haven't been really surveys on this, and you're obviously not going around interviewing every parent in the country, but do you get a sense that there are a lot of parents opting out oh, of, sure. of, of sports that maybe they used to if play? If you look at the numbers of Pop Warner football, the, the, the younger, you know, the, the Pee Wee Leagues, the numbers are way down. You know, and that's sort of, that's sad. But I hope they're finding other sports, because you know what, it's, there are other sports to have that fantastic team experience. I mean, really, there's a lot. You could all play baseball, it's fine. <laughs> when you think about uh, the NFL controlling information in the way that it has around this issue, where there was, there were amp there was ample opportunity to do plenty of stuff for probably in excess of 20 years here, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, it brings to mind uh, some of the recent scandals regarding cheating, where where the the New England Patriots were were exposed for this inflating mm -hmm. balls mm -hmm. issue, um, and you know, and there were some some investigators who said, well, you know, they haven't really proven much of anything there, 
But if you look at that whole thing with the New England Patriots spying some years ago, mm -hmm. spying on other teams, that was a real scandal. And there was a lot of evidence there that they actually ordered, destroyed, and specifically didn't do an investigation. And, and it, just, it just feels very, very similar to this in the sense that they're able to show you kind of a, a, a scandal that you, can, that you can get your hands around and that, and that you can very clearly say, oh, well, this happened and now it's ended and so on and so forth and, and nothing, and there are no records and there are no Super Bowls at risk it, what have you. But if they'd been spying for 10 years, well, then who knows what, mm -hmm. what, what would count. And the way an institution is able to kind of say, look over here, but not over here, and to get scandal into a tolerable bandwidth, I guess. I mean, it's masterful. The, 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 you know, it's a mega machine. It's the largest entertainment complex in the world. It's bigger than movies. They're bigger than movies. They're bigger than TV. They're the biggest entertainment we have. And, you know, they're really good at what they do and managing the image and managing, protecting the shield. I mean, that's what Roger Goodell talks about. I'm here to protect the shield. And the shield is the brand. So, you know, yeah, the science, it's like a, a little chatter going on. Well, you say you, you hope people are, are finding other sports. It is scary to see that in other sports, that, there's, that there, there seems to be almost even more abandon going on in other sports mm -hmm. around head trauma because people are, are thinking, well, the, the football is where it's a problem. Mm -hmm. And you see these these tiny children bouncing a soccer ball on their heads mm -hmm. for you know minutes at a time. You think that adds up. You have to take the head out of these games. The head we have to remember. And here's the thing: we've known this since the 16th century that the brain inside the skull is there's fluid around the brain. It's floating in there. You put a helmet on the outside of it. Still, you're having the impact of a brain it's going to hit inside the skull wall. Bang, 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 no matter how thick the helmet is. So it's shaking and rattling in there. That's what's happening in impact when you hit your head into stuff. So, of course, you know, the, the woodpeckers who peck their heads all day long, <laughs> that's their job, they have shock absorbers in there. So do rams, so do like animals, they have shock absorbers. We do not have that, it's not in our anatomy. So why are we subjecting our children and ourselves to repeat it at. It's stupid, you know, it really is. Well, don't be stupid. <laughs> Jean Marie Laskus, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. And now, Strangers Drowning with Larissa McFarker. You kind of start your book from a premise that I didn't necessarily assume was the premise that, that, that you'd start with, which is that if you're gonna talk about people who are helping others and doing so with all their lives, that there's a prevailing attitude in society today that there's much, there's something deeply wrong with these people, and that's kind of and that's kind of acceptable to say among among people that that do girders or what have you are are a problem or are or are problematic people or are damaged. Well, I should say right at the beginning that I don't think so. Yeah. But that this is a perception that I encountered. Um, in the course of doing this book, and I wanted to explore where it came from. I should, I should say that I distinguish in the book between what I call, for my purposes, heroes and do-gooders. Heroes are people that no one has a problem with. Heroes are people who come across a situation that needs, that demands something of them, and they rise to the occasion. They do the right thing. So it could be a small thing like helping somebody up in the street who's fallen in front of you, or um, I was writing this book as in a, uh, peak of the Ebola e epidemic, and I was thinking of nurses who had been working in a hospital, and suddenly their hospital is filled with with Ebola patients who could cause them to get sick and die themselves. But they they rise to the occasion, they stay at their work, they do their job, and those are the kinds of people I call heroes. Um, and as I say, no one has a problem with that sort of person. On the other hand, there's a kind of person who goes, as it were, looking for trouble, who plans out a life, a whole life, that will involve doing good deeds of some kind or another. They don't wait to have something thrust upon them. They don't go about their business ordinarily. They plan a whole life of doing good. And the reason I call them do-gooders is precisely because that term is so fraught and sometimes pejorative in our culture, because I wanted to make people think about, well, why is there anything wrong with 
with do-gooders, people who do good, why do we have this feeling that there's something um, uncomfortable and something um, something strange about such people? And I wanted to explore that. And I didn't go into this project thinking that that's what I would find. I started out by writing about people who donated a kidney to a stranger. And I did this because I just admired that act wholeheartedly and wanted to know. You wrote about it, you didn't do I started, it. no, I didn't do it, I didn't do it. Though, yeah. you know, you never know. But I met and talked to several of, th of these people and to my surprise, I found that they had encountered a huge amount of skepticism and even hostility in doing what I thought was an uncomplicatedly good thing. So their friends thought they were just bizarre. Why would you do such a thing for a stranger? Um, it doesn't make any sense, why would you take this risk? Their families were often quite resentful. They, they said, why would you give away something so precious to someone who's not part of the family? What if we get sick? Then you've, you've given to a stranger what belongs rightly to us. And even the doctors, who you would think would be comfortable with the idea of helping strangers, um, were deeply suspicious, thought that the people who wanted to do this were probably nuts, and required them to go through a battery of psychological tests to evaluate them before they would consent to do the surgery. And in fact, I don't know if this has changed, but a few years ago when I was uh, writing about those people, I think half the transplant programs in this country wouldn't even deal with would-be altruistic donors at all. They just thought there must be something wrong with them. Right, we have this, this kind of idea of, I guess, concentric, cur concentric circles of care, that you're allowed to care about your immediate nuclear family. You're allowed to care to somewhat lesser degrees for aunts and uncles and cousins and right. nephews and nieces and what have you. And then beyond that, and then once you get to like fourth, fifth cousins and, and beyond that, you have maybe your town, maybe your state, maybe your country. And and there's there's an expectation that kind of as you expand out, you should be willing to do less and less and less for all these people. And then there's an argument right now that says, uh, that, that I guess kind of the title of this book that says, well, why should you, right? Well, you know, I think this is, I think you're right, but I think that that hasn't always been the case. I think that that is a historical fact about here and now. Um, and that I think there are many, many reasons why right now um, help, caring for your family feels like the most legitimate form of caring and other caring for strangers far away seems a little odd, um, especially when it comes at the expense of your family. And one, well, one the change. That wasn't even possible more than a few hundred years ago. You right. could not care for people a thousand miles away until the modern era. You couldn't right. do what you can do now, which is donate to them directly. But you could do, you could care for them in other forms. So I think one thing that has changed um, our moral culture in the last hundred years is the absence of conscription. Because, you know, there was conscription, of course, in Vietnam, but that was a war that many people disapproved of. It wasn't a war that people felt deeply was important for Americans to fight. Um, so it's really been since World War II that we've had conscription for what many, most people felt was a just war. And so it's been, there's almost no one left alive who's had the experience of it being ordinary and expected to give up a family member, a father, a brother, a son, for a larger cause. And I think the fact that it's been so long since that was normal that now we've, it's come to seem outrageous, the idea that we could give up a family member for the sake of some larger cause that doesn't have anything to do with us personally. Um, it's as though our moral feelings have, for our family, have, have expanded to take the place of these older forms of duty that used to be expected and ordinary for everyone. There's this novel argument that to a degree relies on prior arguments, that we should actually care about someone in Bangladesh as much yeah. as our, perhaps our own children or certainly someone whom we know and might see regularly. And, and that's, uh, that's a, a, a significant school of thought. I mean, Peter Singer articulates that idea and he is a very prominent thinker in, in that moral philosophy world and he's at Princeton University where he a, well regarded for his thoughts and, and gains a lot of traction. Well, it's interesting. I've talked to him about his theories. You know, he, the, the core of it, let me just, um, to, to, to flesh it out, is he makes an argument. He made an argument in a paper he wrote in 1972 called the shallow pond argument. He says, well, suppose you're walking along the road and you see a child drowning in a shallow pond. You could 
save the child's life, but it would muddy your clothes and possibly ruin them. Ought you to do it? Of course, everyone says, yes, of course you should do it. You'd be a monster not to. Well, ha ha, he says, then, but we know that there are children in need all the time whom you could save by donating small amounts of money, no, no more than it would cost to replace your clothes. Um, why should geographical distance make, make the difference? And you know, he said to me that um, when he made this argument in his classes and in papers and at conferences in the 70s and 80s and 90s, people usually said, well, clearly his conclusions uh, are crazy. Where's the flaw in the argument? His conclusions are that we should continue to help children and adults and, and other people until we are, until the point where we're almost as poor as they are, um, as much as we possibly can. And he says that nowadays um, he's making the same arguments and people are taking them more seriously. Um, there's been some moral shift and I don't know the cause of it, but I find it very interesting that people still don't want to think that they are obliged to give everything they have and everything they can to strangers, but they're no longer so sure that that idea must be crazy. But then, and then there's the other end of that argument, the argument that goes against it, uh, where you have through, say, the beginning of early capitalist writings and all the way through to objectivism and Ayn Rand and everybody like that, and that has, and that has gained a real toehold uh, in American thought and perhaps modern Western thought more broadly. And I, what's funny is I think if you ask most people which, do, which argument do you immediately find sympathy with, they would say, oh, well, Peter Singer's argument seems much more <laughs> like something that I'm going to do than, than these you know, very right-wing kind of uh, wealth theocracy or wealth, um, wealth uh, theology ideas. And yet it seems like, I mean, at least from the kind of some of the conversations you're recounting, that in America today, in, in popular discourse, we are tending to be more on the balance of the objectivists and the uh, non-charitable people, and and we're and we're and we're, the, and we're finding those people more common, or more acceptable, or more palatable than the folks who are saying be more selfless. We're dealing with two sets of extremes here. I think probably most of us are um, somewhere further into the middle of that that continuum. But you know, Ayn Rand has said a lot of. Uh, distasteful to me things. Um, but the core of what she might say against altruism is there's a character she has in The Fountainhead, her hero, and he is an anti-altruist. But he's not an anti-altruist because he wants to be rich. He has no interest in money. And he's not an anti-altruist because he's selfish in the ordinary way of, of just wanting to push people away and get everything for himself. He's selfish in a way that other people would describe as, as possessing integrity. What he wants to do with his life is realize his own potential to, to the greatest extent he can, he can possibly do that. In his case, he's an architect. He wants to realize his aesthetic potential. And this is something that um, Ayn Rand has in common with philosophers who we might take ordinarily more seriously, like for instance, one of the most eloquent and persuasive philosophers who opposes utilitarianism of the Peter Singer kind is the late Bernard Williams, who is a, a British philosopher. And he wrote very movingly that if we consider ourselves servants of the world in the Peter Singer mode, if we consider that we are obliged to spend our lives doing as much as we possibly can for other people, then not only stupid petty things like extra cash will have to be abandoned, but the things that make human life worth living, um, preference for our own family, wanting to give them everything that we can, having work that we love deeply that has maybe nothing to do with helping other people directly, art, music, you know, so many things, he argued, would have to be abandoned under a, to a sort of totalitarian, altruistic regime that we can't, that can't be right. It cannot be right that that's what's, uh, what's required of us morally um, while we live on Earth. And so you have these two opposing sets of arguments, and that's one of the things that I wanted to think about with actual lives in my book, because you, know, you can make arguments about how bleak an altruistic life would be or how um, fulfilled a selfish life would be, but those are abstractions. And what I wanted to see was 
how they worked out in actual lives. I wanted to see people who had pushed moral principles almost as far as it's possible to push them and see, well, are those lives bleak or are they actually full of joy and fulfillment, which I think, in fact, they are. Right, but at the same time, there's, there's an element to utilitarianism where, where when they're pushing, say, aid in XYZ rural village to increase, uh, say, uh, child, uh, uh, the, ant the opposite of child mortality, child lividity. And when you're doing that, um, you know, the idea is you're saving lives, right? And isn't saving lives inherently worthy and inherently the best goal? But at the same time, you're, you're not doing anything to fix the broader structure of their lives, and you're modeling a kind of life in which you ignore family, community, children, and love for those around you. And if you, if you chose a society to build, you know, you, you might choose one that has more selfishness but family and love and community dynamic than one that has more selflessness but everybody's depressed and miserable and wondering if their parents love them. <laughs> well, yeah, I did have a, uh, I was trying to explain this book to my children and uh, they got the impression that it was about people who save uh, strangers rather than their children. I had to reassure them this was not quite the case. But um, the thing about utilitarianism is that you can, you can modify it in many ways because the basic principle is just to bring about as much good in the world as you can. And most utilitarians, most utilitarians are not even utilitarians. Most utilitarians have agreed, say John Stuart Mill, for instance, or Henry Sidgwick in the 19th century, that the way to bring about the most good in the world is not in fact to be completely impartial between your own children and strangers. In fact, the world will be a better place if you do um, give some partiality to your family um, and the, the love that parents feel for their children and the desire they feel to protect them above all others is a good thing and the world would be worse off without it. So you can build those things into the model. Absolute impartiality is advocated by perhaps almost nobody. Um, but that said, a, a someone with a utilitarian impulse will certainly say, well, okay, you can prefer your children, but to a limited degree, you can't abandon strangers out there. You can't just shut yourself up in your family house and ignore the fact that there are people um, starving and suffering all the time. So I think it's really a matter of degree. And the people in my book love their families, that none of them is completely impartial. Um, none of them, uh, they all love their children if they have them or their parents, but they're willing to put them at, at risk and, and introduce them to sacrifices. I'll give you an example. Um, there's a couple who founded a leprosy colony in India in the 1950s. And when they did that, they applied to the state for land and were given um, a tract of wilderness which was, in which there was no water. They had to dig wells to get water. There was no shelter. They had to build them out of sticks and mud. They had no money. And there were wild animals ro roaming around. And they moved there with their two sons who were at that time, I think they were both under the age of two, very tiny, and four dogs to protect them from the wild animals. And in the first few months that they were there, the, every single one of the dogs was carried off and eaten by a tiger. The two human babies were not, but they might have been. And we now know that leprosy is not in fact very contagious, but they didn't know that then. The children might have caught leprosy and become leprosy patients themselves. They didn't, but they might have. And so that's the level of risk um, to which a really committed do-gooder might be prepared to put their own family. And not everyone feels that's right. And when we take that and we follow that through, one of the things that struck me about a lot of the, the, the more successful stories of, of people who've, cho who've chosen to be do-gooders and, and see this through in their lives is that they had to create some kind of fence. They had to create some kind of restriction that there is a point to which we will be charitable and there is a point to which we will stop. And, and, and sometimes that's a portion of income and mm -hmm. sometimes that's a, a number of years spent doing a given activity. And that it was, it seems like within those boundaries is where they found something like sanity and and the ability to live with with some normal. Absolutely, and that is an incredibly difficult and important achievement that um, all the people that I wrote about have achieved. Um, I think many, 
probably are not able to because if you are the sort of person who really feels vividly the suffering of strangers in either close by or in distant parts of the world, it's very difficult to turn that off, to say, okay, at this point, for the sake of my own sanity and for my future commitment, I have to draw limits. I have to uh, stop and take some time for myself or I'm going to go crazy. And some people don't manage to do that and they burn out or they just become completely panicked and paralyzed and overwhelmed. Um, but the people in my book have done this. I'll give you an example. There's a couple who um, live in Cam well, they used to live in Cambridge. They live near Boston, Massachusetts. And when I met them a few years ago, they were in their mid-20s, and they had to make the two decisions which for anyone, not just for a committed do-gooder, are two of the most important decisions you'll make, uh, what to do for a career and whether or not to have a child. And they thought about them quite differently from most of us. Um, the woman of the couple, Julia Wise, um, had always wanted to be a social worker. She ha and but she knew that social workers earn very little money, and she was committed to alleviating as much suffering as she could by donating money to effective charities. And so, was it morally okay for her to become a social worker? She knew she would do some good as a social worker, but she felt that she could have she could do more good if she say became a corporate lawyer earned tons of money and gave that money away. So was it okay for her not to become a corporate lawyer? And was there really any difference between, um, in effect, spending that extra money on becoming a social worker and spending it on you know, fancy clothes and vacations? She struggled with that for a while. And she ultimately decided that for the sake of her sanity, she was going to become a social worker and live with the reality that she was not giving money that she could have given. Another decision faced a similar calculus. Should she have a child? She, again, she had always wanted to have a child. She'd always, even when she was a child herself, dreamed about the games she would play with her children and the toys she would make for them. But she knew that however frugal she was as a mother, she was inevitably going to end up spending some of her resources on a child of her own. Was that okay? She realized in effect, by having a child of my own, I will be killing somebody else's child because I will not be donating the money that might buy medicine that would save that other child's life. Is that okay? And if you are the kind of person who not only thinks this intellectually, but also feels it, as Julia does, this is a really, really, really difficult decision. Ultimately, she decided to have a child, but she struggled with it. And I think she made the right decision because I think having decided to do the work she loved and have a child, she will be able to maintain her commitment to donating um, for the rest of her life. But it was really difficult. It reminds me of uh, a, a scene from a television show where a, a, te a teacher was being very selfless and concerned about a given student and the vice principal said to him, have you, do you have kids yet? Because if you don't, you really should start. Because you're not going to be able to adopt these children individually and actually take care of them and see them through. And you need to have something, I guess, maybe is it something that's more in your control? Or is it something that's more within what you can do and that's how you get to, to sanity or to fulfillment? I think it's, it's a question of sanity. I think it's a question of realizing, you know, I think the 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 instance that we've all um, noticed with some disturbance is the injunction on, on airplanes to put your own mask on first before you put the oxygen mask on, on the child next to you. And your first instinct as a parent is, well, what do you mean? But of course, when you think about it for one second, you realize if I am oxygen deprived and I can't think properly, I'm not going to be able to help anybody else. And so that is the right thing to do. But it's, it's interesting that you brought up adoption because of a very complicated instance of this um, calculation between s children and strangers um, came to another couple I wrote about. I, I usually write about couples because, of course, if you're going to be a very committed do-gooder, it's going to, you, you don't do it alone. It involves your whole family. Um, this is a couple who live in Philadelphia who adopted 20 special needs kids in addition to the two kids they had, um, biological kids that they had. And, um, you know, in each instance, Every time they adopted a new kid or set of kids, they adopted a, uh, several sibling groups. Um, 
they had to think, well, how will this affect the children we already have? And, you know, they really loved their children. This was a deep question for them. They, this was not an orphanage. This was a real family. But, you know, whereas I think most of us would think, well, if I adopt, say, six more kids, it's going to deprive the kids I have of attention. Therefore, I shouldn't do it. It might, uh, it might adversely affect the children I already have, and that's it. That's the last word. But for them, it wasn't the last word because they didn't just think of the children they already had. They thought, well, it's true, if we adopt these six more kids, we'll have less time and less attention for the kids we already have, and that will make their lives a little bit worse. But if we can dramatically improve the lives of these other six, ki six kids who are still strangers to us, but whose terrible lives we know about because we've read about them, um, then it's worth it. And I think that was um, an, a, an incredible decision. And I, this, this couple did an extraordinary thing, but it was each time very difficult to make that choice. One of the things you kept bringing up, uh, the idea of what you're, of how someone feels and that they're, that they kind of are this way, and it's not something that they can really dispel, or, or it's, it's not something they can, they can expel, rather, um, that, that they, they feel this internally, this need to help. And there is a portion here where you get into the idea that, uh, uh, and a psychoanalysis assessment, that maybe these people are fundamentally damaged, uh, and that, that that is what makes them this way. So review that quickly for us. I don't, I don't believe that. Yeah. I don't believe that the people, I mean, I'm sure there are some fundamentally damaged do-gooders, like they're fundamentally damaged all kinds of people, but um, the people I wrote about are, are, are totally sane and I admire them wholeheartedly. But what you're alluding to is there is a whole history in the social sciences and especially in psychoanalysis of thinking that people who are so altruistic, there must be something wrong with them. They must be a little crazy. Freud used the phrase moral masochism to describe people with an extreme sense of moral duty. And his daughter, Anna Freud, who was also a very well-known psychoanalyst, was even more, uh, even more severe. She said that there must be, it was a kind of perversion to uh, only be able to gratify your search for happiness through a proxy, through the happiness of someone else. And this dominated, this view dominated the social sciences for most of the 20th century because there was a sense that humans are fundamentally selfish and so anything that looks like altruism can't really be altruism. It must be some kind of mental illness or it must be selfishness disguised in some other form. But I think that's changing. Um, it's changing in psychoanalysis, it's changing in um, psychology and even in um, biology for a for more than a century, most biologists felt that Darwin's idea of group selection, by which Darwin, who did believe in altruism, explained how it could evolve naturally. Which is the idea that you would have that kind of the, the group evolves as opposed to just it, that is involved in that yes. in, that, in that survival of the fittest and not just the individual and therefore an exactly. altruistic individual is valuable. Exactly. Right? It's the idea that the groups of people who are prepared to sacrifice for one another and be altruistic is going to prosper more than a group of selfish individuals who are just out to kill each other. And, but this idea was dismissed for, for more than a century, but now it's being revived by E.O. Wilson and David Sloan Wilson, among others, in biology. It's become respectable again. So I think something is shifting, that altruism uh, is not going to be dismissed in the future as a, fo a form of craziness in the way that it often was in the past. All right, well, let's see how the future looks for altruism. Larissa McFarker, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. That's all for this week's episode of Up Close. A reminder, you can also listen to an audio-only version of this program as a podcast available on iTunes and your favorite podcast player. The Jewish Channel is available on cable, Time Warner Cable Channel 1640, Iowa Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Cox Cable Channel 1, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, and on Comcast on the on-demand menu on TV channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.